Professor and Chairperson of the Department of Health Professions at Hofstra University. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Supporting Older Adults in the Time of COVID-19. I'm so pleased to see that we have a great turnout for this incredibly serious and really important topic. As we all know, the COVID-19 disease has hit older adults harder than other age groups. Older adults are more likely to already have underlying chronic conditions that we now know raise the risk of severe COVID-19 symptoms and COVID-19 related death. Public health officials have taken a number of steps to slow the spread of COVID-19 and reduce its impact on older adults. These new guidelines have resulted in significant modifications to community-based social support programs and services and long-term care programs. We have three leaders in the field here with us today to share their expertise and experience on how these modifications are working and to reflect on what the future of care and support might look like for older adults as we continue through this pandemic and beyond. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to review how this webinar will work. First off, all participants have their microphones turned off so we can reduce background noise. We will be using the chat function to collect questions, which we will address throughout the webinar. To post a question in the chat, you need to look at the bottom menu bar, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can click on the chat button and you'll see a space for typing at the bottom. Please note that you have the choice to send your comment or question to everyone or just to one other attendee. Last note, we will be providing certificates of attendance for interested webinar participants. At the end of the webinar, I will share my email address and telephone number, and any participants who would like a certificate of attendance can email me directly. Okay, let's get started. The order of speakers follows the order listed on this slide. We will hear first from Mr. Stuart Almer, the President and CEO of Gerwin Healthcare System. And then we will hear from Mr. George Martinez, the Deputy Commissioner of Nassau County's Office for the Aging. And then we will hear from Ms. Christine Rice, the Executive Director of the Glen Cove Senior Center. Our speakers represent the entire continuum of care for older adults, from community-based programming to skilled inpatient nursing home care. We will take one to two questions after each panelist speaks, and then hopefully have time for more Q&A at the end of the hour. We may not be able to get to all the questions that are in the chat, during this webinar, but I will make sure to respond to everyone, even if it's after the webinar ends. So let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Almer. Stuart B. Almer is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Gerwin Healthcare System, which includes Gerwin Jewish Nursing and Rehabilitation Center, the Gerwin Jewish Fay Lindner Residences and Assisted Living Community, the Gerwin Home Care Agency, the Gerwin Healthcare Foundation, and a new independent living community, the Fountain Gate Gardens. Prior to joining Gerwin in 2015, Mr. Almer served as Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Parker Jewish Institute for Healthcare and Rehabilitation. And prior to that, as Vice President of Operations at Peninsula Hospital Center. Mr. Almer has also held senior management positions at Syosset Community Hospital, Brookdale University Hospital Medical Center, and Huntington Hospital. Stu, we know you and your staff have been working hard to protect the many vulnerable populations that you serve during this pandemic. Can you please share with us how Gerwin has approached this extremely challenging time? And you'll need to just unmute. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Corinne, thank you very much. Uh, for many years, I taught at Hofstra, aside from my regular work, and I always had great stories, at least I thought they were great stories, to come into the classroom each day, never knowing that I would deal with a pandemic to this magnitude. Certainly being in long-term care in a nursing home per se, um, you can't imagine the challenges we have actually been through and continue to go through each day, although the situation in New York is better. And I certainly can feel for those individuals who are in other states right now and beginning to go through what we went through, which was ex extreme going back to March of this year and again, still continuing today. But with it all, um, we worked very hard to get off to a good start 
as good a start as folks can get off to during a crisis. We never expected though to have such a, uh, a number of events, almost a perfect storm that occurred. And when I say perfect storm, I'm talking about issues of media, uh, the state in terms of the regulatory climate, families, dealing with our own staff, and of course, not the least, all the financial implications of this pandemic. It has absolutely been uh, devastating the entire impact, but through it all, we're trying to recover. We felt that we got off to a good start. We got off to a good start because we knew that in Seattle, uh, things were very difficult there, and we knew that we needed to do a good job of acquiring as much personal protective equipment or PPE as much as possible. So we did get a good jump on that. Um, clearly we, we acquired a good amount of material to keep our staff safe and the goal to keep our residents safe. We also developed an isolation unit before anyone else was looking to do this with a dedicated entrance. And again, doing our best, knowing we'd have an onslaught ultimately of positive patients and we would work to keep them safe. We have a very vulnerable population here at Gerwin, as do most nursing homes. We have folks who are often unstable, fragile, elderly, with a large dementia population. We also know the dementia population was very heavily impacted by COVID-19. Of all the challenges we experienced, I think I'll say that the family dynamics were probably the most challenging and still are. Families have not been able to see their loved ones now for over three months and we really have no firm uh, signal as to when things will reopen so that we can easily see our families back here. I happen to be a family member as well. My father's been a resident here at Gerwin for a year and a half. I'm grateful that he is well, um, worry about him certainly, and feel that I can relate to all other family members here who are going through the same experience. Certainly the financial impact has been devastating and I just wanna outline that briefly with all of the regulatory requirements, which literally change daily, including a mandate back in late March that required us to accept positive patients from the hospitals really was a game changer for us. This sent families off into, I'll say, a frenzy. And once that occurred, they began calling the state. And when you call the state, the state calls us or visits us. They would call the media, the media calls us. And it just started this firestorm or frenzy um, that was hard to control. But we tried our best to get out, get out ahead of it. Uh, again, regarding uh, just finances, so I cover that for you all. Uh, so our census has really taken a great beating. Um, all elective admissions stopped and are just now beginning to start again. So that impacted us a great deal. Right now, the community is concerned about bringing their loved ones to a nursing home. And that's gonna be a great challenge for us going forward. Uh, the media impact has been extraordinary. Once the mandate was in place that we had to accept positive patients, families um, it really begot, began to be the greatest, the greatest struggle for us. So our census got impacted. But at the end of the day, it's what the community thinks of us and restoring confidence in them that they will come back to us and see us as an important provider, a successful nonprofit in the community. Many of the nonprofits in this industry have been going away. We've demonstrated success and are working very hard to stay viable and be successful in the future. So one of the positions that we took that I would give guidance to others is to uh, be open and be accessible, be transparent with the media. The community will see that. The community will know that you're trusting, caring, and know that you're just going through the challenges of a pandemic. To no exaggeration, I have conducted at least 30 interviews between print, television media, radio, uh, and almost all to the positive, and really trying to fend off the negative. And I really believe at the end of the day, that will be part of our, our success. So it's something that I suggest to others who are going through this. Our website communications. We have been so transparent in putting information on our website so that everyone is up to date. And that might also include, it includes expirations, number of cases that we have, uh, measures that we've put in place to keep staff safe, to keep patients safe, just general information for families, even state mandates we have posted to be the most transparent so everyone understands what we have been through here. But with that, we've done some very good creative things that I think going forward are going to be very useful in long-term care.
we develop what's called gram grams. They're basically videos, uh, live video, that families can have with their loved ones on a scheduled basis. Loved ones can even make their own video and send them into us, and we will show them to our loved one. Now we're doing drive-bys. So families can now come by again on a scheduled basis, see their loved one from their car, at least be able to see them again and keep community contact. So we're very pleased how that has gone. Uh, we've been very active in terms of our screening of any staff who come into the building. We test staff weekly. By code, it was twice weekly. That screening continues. We ask them questions about where they may have traveled. And we also take their temperature to make sure they do not have a fever and it's safe for them to come in and take care of residents in the building. These measures, I believe, will continue and need to continue to keep folks safe going forward. Other things that have impacted us, our assisted living facility, which usually is relatively full, like the nursing home, has had 33 open apartments. So we just continue to deal with major challenges. Our adult day healthcare program, which had 130 residents coming here per day, has been closed with no sign of the state allowing us to reopen. So all of these impacts have been dramatic. We're just trying to deal with them going forward. So I believe the testing, certainly uh, the videos are being accessible to the media, the website communications, this will all be important going forward. We can already see how things are changing going forward. If we're able to open adult day healthcare, um, we know that will be limited in terms of the number of residents we have. And also keeping a, a proper separation so that residents, when they do come back, are safe. One other comment I'd like to make, I've been very vocal in the media, as I said before. I believe that one thing that would have helped us all much better would be if there were dedicated facilities for COVID-19 uh, and not introduce positive residents into the nursing homes that really created the greatest challenges for us. We don't know if that actually uh, uh, created worsening of the pandemic, but one has to wonder if it did. With that, I thank you all and look forward to questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stu. Um, I just, one, one quick question and then I'll see if there's another one in the chat and we'll do most of our Q&A later at the end. But I just, um, you started to get at it towards the end of your comments, and that is about if we are expecting a second wave, which many of the public health officials do think will occur sometime in the fall, um, you know, some of the lessons learned may include like this dedicated facilities. Are there other things that you'd like to see, you know, the state and others do differently to help you support a safe and yet thriving environment? Well, it's interesting. We have plans uh, for many other programs and services, things that we're trying to move along. And with COVID-19, getting approvals, whether it be county, town, state, have all been held up. And we understand that. We understand the impact COVID has had has been significant uh, impact on all of our services. Uh, so getting the right support, whether it be legislative or from our trade associations to help push through to allow us to move ahead on our projects. Allowing us to move ahead on our projects will help us in other ways. So even if not specific to the pandemic, getting approvals and moving our agenda along will ultimately help us. Uh, any contributions we've gotten in terms of PPE has been very well received. I received a call from uh, a legislative official just late last week uh, asking, you know, would it be helpful if, if they could get us 25,000 masks uh, for staff use? And we said, absolutely, that would be a great help. So anything that can be done in terms of uh, grants uh, legislative support is helpful to us. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to, just going to ask you one other question that comes out of the chat and then we'll um, move on and come back towards the end. The question is about um, whether or not you've incorporated any new technology to help um, residents and family members, maybe perhaps those who don't live close, stay connected. Stu, I'm just... Oh, uh, yes, got it. So one of the things we did was we uh, secured and purchased iPads. The iPads went to our staff who were deployed to the units, and those iPads were used for the video calls with residents. That has gone a long way. One of the use of technology is now the significance of telemedicine. Telemedicine, although has been growing over the few years, 
has now been significantly embraced. So we've had opportunities for our home care residents and our adult daycare residents who are at home and need monitoring, need support, need care, we've been able to implement telemedicine. We have grants now pending in terms of the area of telemedicine. So certainly having the tablets, telemedicine, uh, certainly great inroads in the area of technology. Excellent, thank you so much. And we'll come back to you in just a little bit. Really appreciate your remarks. So let me now introduce George Martinez. Mr. Martinez is currently the Deputy Commissioner of Nassau County's, uh, the Nassau County Department of Human Services Office for the Aging, where he currently oversees over 14 senior centers, the Meals on Wheels programs, and numerous other programs. Mr. Martinez is on the board of directors of a number of organizations, including the Beth Page Federal Credit Union and Vision Long Island. He was a board member of the Long Island Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, of which he was a past president. So George, I know you and your staff have been working tirelessly to find creative and safe alternatives for the many essential programs and services that fall under your umbrella. Can you speak with us now about how the Department for the Aging is responding to the crisis and what kinds of innovations you've implemented to continue serving seniors in Nassau County? And you may have to unmute, George. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, as you can see by the screen, I'm not Christine. Um, I'm using my wife's laptop. So I apologize. It's been one of those days where everything else didn't work, but this laptop worked. So I'm glad everybody can hear me and see me okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting us uh, to be part of this conference. As a Hofstra alumni, it always gives me a great pleasure to participate with a Hofstra function uh, and such a distinguished panel. Um, before anything else, I just want a couple of things I want to bring up. Uh, just kind of give people an idea to exactly what the Office for the Aging does. Uh, you know, we are we are chartered going back to the old American, uh, Aging American Act in the 1960s. So we really oversee a lot of things in this office. But our main goal is to maximize the independence for the seniors in our office. And as you mentioned before, uh, we currently oversee 14 senior centers, three lunch programs, and five social debt adult programs. Um, other than that, there's two other things I want to bring up. I personally want to thank the staff of the Office for the Aging. They have done an amazing job uh, during these last few weeks and months. Uh, it's just absolutely the dedication to work. I can't say enough positive things about the staff of the Nassau County. I also want to thank our partners, um, Catholic Charities, EAC, FCA, for their tremendous cooperation, flexibility, and hard work. Um, as you can imagine, this has been a tremendous toll on all of us involved. Um, this is, by, as you guys know, this is the most affected a part of our population. A lot of the seniors to begin with were having a very difficult time as where they were. Our office, our, you know, our office gives us three things. We run the Meals on Wheels program, we run a large case manager, and we run these centers. Uh, for a lot of the residents in, free, in, uh, in this county, these centers become really a cent the whole purpose of their lives. So just to give you some numbers, just so people don't realize, um, they're, they're based on the last available numbers, there's close to 370,000 residents in Nassau County over the age of 60. We are becoming the oldest county in the United States. I'll say it again. If the numbers that we're seeing are correct, Nassau County is rapidly becoming the oldest county in the United States. So you can imagine what that means and what the impact has, everything from housing to transportation to the labor market. Um, you know, if you're looking to start a business in Nassau County, your, your, your future clients are those people over the age of 60. We're, we are also experiencing the largest growth of people 85 and over. So once again, it's just compounding over and over again. Prior, uh, prior to this, uh, this crisis occurring, just give you an idea of what we did. Between our senior centers and our Meals and Wheels program, we serve almost 600,000 meals in Nassau County. Think about that. We're one of the one of the richest counties in the United States, and we were providing almost 600,000 meals. And so as you can imagine, this hits. The first thing we did, we had to find a way to keep our seniors safe. So we closed the centers. We closed the centers for the public, but one of the things that we did with the support of the county executive 
and the state, we were able to keep the staff on site. So that was a big help. By having staff on site, we were able to do three things. Communication. We requested and we asked for, we got daily communications with all the members of the senior center. Real important. Make sure they're okay and make sure what's going on. We also kind of took a chance early on when we saw this, this wave coming on, and we were one of the first counties to buy shelf-stable meal boxes. Uh, each meal box consists anywhere from three to five individual meals. So we were very early on, we were able to acquire those products and continue to do so. Uh, we also had to change the way we do things. Um, people who before were, you know, a system manager in, in, a, in a senior center, now they were drivers. Uh, people who were the kitchen work, now they're on the phone. Um, so on and on. So, so we had to do two things. We had to make sure that our seniors stayed safe. And, and secondly, we had to make sure that we continue to provide those services to them in any way possible. So it was just absolutely amazing how everybody came, up, came around. The, the, our partners and our staff came around. And just to give you uh, some crazy things, during this, between the last 12 weeks alone, and I don't have the numbers for June 1st, but just on the Meals on Wheels program, we added about 650 new clients. And during that period of time, just on Meals on Wheels, we served over 112,000 meals. In addition to that, we had people kind of fell outside the boundaries of the Meals on Wheels. So we had a creative, so we were able, working through local restaurants, we were able to provide an additional 10,000 meals to those seniors who were really in need. Uh, with the shelf stable uh, boxes, and that's an ongoing process, we continue to do this. So far, we're over 30,000 meals served. So just in a, in a small amount of time, and these 12 to 14 weeks, between the meals and wheels, drastic increase. The, uh, the meals from outside also increased in the shelf stable meals, were over 150,000 meals served. On top of that, we had to get a little creative and provide support and comfort. One of the things that we did working in New York State, we were able to acquire robotic pets, robotic cats and dogs. Uh, they're a tremendous source of comfort and support for, the, for our seniors. Uh, as of last Friday, uh, we've given out almost 200 of these pets. We also are concerned about our seniors, but also the members who work at the centers. Uh, in the last uh, few weeks alone, we've given out over 32,000 masks. And the next week, we're going to be giving out another 9,000 bottles of hand sanitizer. And we'll continue to do this. Uh, as the process goes along, we'll continue to support the mass of sanitizers, not only for the seniors, but also for the people working at our, at our department. And then last but not least is uh, we have what we call the New York Connects, which is our main phone call. We ask everybody to call this one number. And the phone calls have been amazing. Uh, we get everything from, as you can imagine, people asking for food, asking for housing, asking for transportation, and sometimes just somebody to talk to. And that's why you know, our main focus has been provide the basic basic services with the help, make sure that we don't miss a beat. And I'll tell you right now, I am so proud of our staff and our, and our members. We have not missed a beat. It has been really amazing how everybody came together. You know, as people always say, when, there's something, when a crisis comes along, you really see who people are. And this has been a tremendous uh, exercise of how people have been and the support, and, and in some cases, incredible patience <laughs> that we need to have during this period of time. So we have changed. Um, we've changed the way we do things. Um, I think we're much, we're much quicker. Uh, we're much more creative. And we've also something that I know is very hard to believe in government, but we've actually expanded our social media. Uh, the use of our website and the use of Facebook has been a tremendous tool. We're actually doing uh, exercise classes through our Facebook, uh, cooking classes and nutritional classes uh, through the Facebook and has been a tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, feedback on how that works. Excellent. Thank you so much. And that actually, um, that last point you made responds to one of the questions that came up on the chat, and that was about virtual programming and have you been able to introduce yes. any virtual programming? So was this for um, folks that you were serving prior that had already been on Facebook and engaged, or are these new folks to the virtual programming component? Actually, it's been a combination of both. Um, we, are, we are surprised that, uh, you know, even though, you know, we think everybody knows who we are, there's a significant number of people who don't know who we are and have found, have found out about us through the, the need for food and need for basics. So we're getting both. We're getting people who have been longtime members of the centers, but we're also getting people who didn't know we exist. And now we're seeing significant spikes in our Facebook hits, uh, particularly when we do the exercise classes and uh, in the cooking classes. We partner up with the, uh, the Cornell Cooperative, and they've done some pretty creative, uh, simple cooking classes uh, for seniors. 
Excellent. That's great. One other question before um, we'll move on to hear from Christine and then we'll come back. Uh, and that is about volunteers. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you've handled volunteers. I know that you, you know, typically would engage with volunteers. Have you had more people reach out? Uh, you know, I, I know lots of folks are looking to see how they can help and how have you handled that aspect? It's, it's kind of been like a, a juggling act that, uh, with the centers being closed. It's been difficult to get the volunteers, but we have had quite a lot of volunteers helping us with, with delivering the meals and delivering some of the things. So that has been a big plus with that project and that aspect on it. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, George. And no, thank you. I know we'll come back at the end um, with another couple of questions, but I would like to now introduce um, Christine Rice. Right. And so uh, Ms. Rice is the executive director of the Glen Cove Senior Center. The Glen Cove Senior Center offers opportunities, adventures, and assistance in meeting the challenges of aging to senior citizens 60 years of age and over. Christine brings years of knowledge from her own personal and professional caregiving experience, including dementia care, along with a past history of grant writing and fundraising. Previously, Ms. Rice was the Director of Special Events and Community Outreach at the Long Island Alzheimer's and Dementia Center located in Westbury, New York. Christine, I know the Glen Cove Senior Center has been closed since mid-March. Can you talk with us about what essential services you have continued and what creative alternatives, such as virtual programming that you've instituted to maintain connection with your members? And you may have to unmute, yeah. Thank you, Karine. Thank you so much for including me today. Um, yeah, the, well, the Glen Cove Senior Center is one of the largest senior centers. We have 2,000 members. Um, and on a daily basis, we could have anywhere between 100 and 200 members there during the day, uh, whether it be just for programming or uh, for lunch. We do serve lunch every day. Um, and we have numerous programs that go on. When we did get um, closed at the beginning of March, um, it was a concern right away for myself and my staff. I have to say, I, I have the most amazing staff ever. They're very close and connected to all the members um, that come every day. They get to know them personally. Um, it's a great way to kind of uh, keep an eye on seniors and see if they need things. Um, seeing them every day, you see certain changes in them and you can help them. We have a wonderful social worker, um, Sherry Meager, who is there, who helps so many people on different levels from housing to healthcare to anything that they could possibly need. So when we were closed the beginning of March, um, I immediately knew that somehow we were gonna to have to be able to stay connected to the members, not only on um, a meal distribution level, but on a personal connection level. Um, and I knew that the virtual was the way to go for that, that we had to. We really had not um, done that in the past. We do have a website and we do have a Facebook page, um, but I knew that needed to be um, enhanced. So immediately Eric Schumer, um, Jim and myself, who is our program coordinator, and all the other staff got together to figure out how that would be possible. Uh, as talked before, it wasn't, it's not always easy. Sometimes um, I can say for myself, I'm not a senior yet, but sometimes technology is very challenging for me. And for the seniors, I was very impressed. Um, the majority of them really wanted to get involved. They wanted to stay connected, but there were some challenges. <laughs> so we had um, Eric, who was instrumental in trying to, first of all, get in touch with all of our instructors and all of our entertainers to see if they would be interested on do, in doing the virtual programming. Um, you know, for them, we figured a lot of their business has stopped as well. And thanks to Nassau County Office of the Aging and George and, and EAC, um, who partially fund some of our entertainment and instructors, they have been very, very um, cooperative and helpful and supportive in us getting this up and running. So immediately we contacted all of our instructors um, to see who would be, want to be involved. And the majority of them did. And the technology of it sometimes became a little difficult and figuring out you know, how to keep things on and they're taping at home and how to do that and how to get seniors involved. Um, we had a lot of volunteers and some of our interns that were working with us that no longer could come to the center. So they were able to call um, the seniors and give them the technological advice that they needed. Uh, on top of that, immediately I had all of our staff making phone calls on a daily basis. We um, went back and printed out the names of the people who came consistently over the last year and a half 
And we started with that list. And we'd call every day just to see how they're doing, if they needed meals. Um, originally, as George said, we um, got provided by Nassau County the shelf safe, shelf safe meals um, in the boxes. So we were seeing who was in need and who needed to be those delivered. And we were delivering, myself and my staff, we were delivering them um, with as, as much covering as we possibly could. And, and until at some point they, you know, we got recommended that we need to stop because it was just too dangerous. We didn't have the full PPE covering, but um, thankfully we only had to stop that for a couple of weeks. And then we were back up and running in, in that. Um, so the program, virtual program, um, took a couple of weeks to kind of get started, get set up um, and figure out how we can connect people to this. Uh, a lot of people are on Facebook now, social media, as you all know, is such a, thank God, I really every day say thank God for social media during this because otherwise, I don't know how we would keep in touch with them as much as we do. Um, with Facebook, Instagram, and our website, uh, we were helping a lot of people, um, interns were calling, just helping them walk them through whether they had an iPad or a laptop, phone, however they could do it, to either sign onto our website, which we updated um, with all of our programming. So the calendar of the week that we had, it would be put on our website and all you'd have to go to was to the virtual programming, click it, and each day had the time and the schedule and all you had to do was click on it and you immediately got into the Facebook Live, if it was at that time. The good thing about that is Facebook Live can be saved. So all of these programs that we had, if somebody was not available at the time it was being shown, they could go back and watch it another time or they could go back and do chair yoga. Uh, they can go back, we have a wonderful man, Chuck Van Horn, who does um, art classes. Individuals love that. So they could go back at any time to be able to see it. So I think that's been a huge plus. Um, on top of that, Lori um, Fuente, is, who is my um, administrative assistant, started what we call coffee, coffee clutches a couple days a week. So she would get in touch with different members, um, kind of revolving to see who wanted to and would be on um, either Zoom or Teams. And they would just chat for 45 minutes just talking to each other about how they're feeling and what's going on. And, you know, it's a very isolating time um, and a very scary time for seniors. So to be able to see your friends um, face to face and see that they're still doing well and talking about grandkids and great grandkids is, it was really, really um, very important. And on top of that, we had the meal program. Um, after the shelf stay meals, we uh, were able to get our caterer to deliver meals to our location, thanks to the Nass County um, Office of the Asian who was helping who fund, support that, then we were delivering now three days a week um, to probably about almost 70 people a day. So we're reaching a lot of people. Um, some people don't need it every day. Some people would like it every day. Um, it's for them, a lot of individuals who came to our seniors came there for the meal. Um, plus, it, that's also a way of socializing and seeing each other. So us just being able to deliver it, we now have our buses going out. Originally, it was just the staff, but we have our buses and staff on the buses now going out and delivering. It's also just a way to get to see them. We're very safe in how we do it. Uh, we call them up. We, we, I'm sorry, we call them up to see if they want the meal. We deliver their meal to their house. We get back in the car and we call them and say it's there. So there's no contact um, they're all, they're all wonderful, they love it when they get it, and it, it gives them a little feel of you know, home and, and what they can do. Uh, we also have an adult day program uh, that we have downstairs for individuals with dementia or any form of dementia or physical um, handicap. They also, down there, the director and the coordinator have been doing daily phone calls and Zoom calls. Um, all of their staff have been calling every day. We've been getting unbelievable testimonials about I don't know what I would do, my mother would do without the phone calls. It's a connection, even just seeing in Zoom. Um, as George was talking about, we got the automatronic pets, which are, they're a gift. I just, as a matter of fact, posted it on our Facebook page, which is Glen Cove Senior Center, if anybody wants to go on and see it, of a couple of our uh, adult day members who got them and the smiles on their faces. It's very therapeutic. I know personally from my mom who had Alzheimer's, um, I, I got a real puppy for her because I knew I needed something, you know, for, to comfort her. And these, these um, companion pets are a lifesaver for a lot of them. So that was a, a wonderful donation. We we're extremely thankful for that. And we're hoping that, you know, going forward, uh, you know, bringing everybody back, waiting to see how that's going to be. A lot of these programs, we are going to continue. Um, we're working closely with Glen Cove Hospital as well. We've been doing a lot of um, live streaming. Uh, especially with Dr. Kieber, 
she was on a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had individuals given their questions before it started so that she could answer them because they really want, especially the seniors to know, you should not ignore your health. I know it's, you, they're not allowed to be out really or going to the hospitals, but they wanted to let them know that it is safe now to call up your doctors, make appointments. Um, don't forget about that because you don't want any health issues uh, to become worse. Um, and I think it was a real comfort to a lot of people hearing um, that information. So we have been trying to do as much as we can. You know, we had a, a, one of our, our only fundraiser that was canceled in June, but we're hoping for that for next year. You know, we can always um, use the support and people are very, very supportive. we got a lot of volunteers and my staff is just, I have to say, um, nonstop. I mean, really working hard and I've had a lot of help from the county in terms of how to keep the meals going and recording things and, um, we're getting a lot of positive feedback that our seniors can't wait to come back. So we're looking forward to that. Excellent. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, I'm glad that all three of you recognized, you know, the incredible work that your staff are doing. And so we'll just give them another shout out. It's really great and amazing how everybody's been able to pivot and, you know, persevere through this. Um, one question I have for you is about, are you serving non-members and how is that working? Are you getting a lot of calls from folks who perhaps weren't members or only attended one event in the past and now are looking for support and maybe from their families? Yes, we are. It did, they don't have to be a member of the center. They just need to be 60 years and older. Um, they can be in Nassau County, but our catchment area is Glenhead, Glen Cove, um, Glenwood Landing and Seacliff. So that's where our buses can deliver to. Um, we have been getting through word of mouth through a lot of our members. They have been talking with their friends, um, you know, saying how, how much support they're getting from the senior center. We are getting a lot more people looking at our website and our Facebook page and calling up to see if they, if they can get meals. Um, and also honestly calling to say, can you drop off an application because we want to become a member once the senior center is back open. And we're hoping for that. We, we really are excited about that because you know, sometimes, um, and senior centers are amazing places. I am honored and proud to be, you know, part of the senior center. And there's so many programs that people don't even understand that we offer and how much help there can be, um, you know, when you go and how enjoyable it is. I have so many women and men who have said, yeah, my kids pushed me and I, I don't necessarily, didn't necessarily want to come. And now I've been here for the last five, six, seven years and I have new best friends and just love it. So it is, the numbers are growing and we're really happy about that. Excellent. Um, the next question comes from the chat and it's really, I mean, all three of you may want to comment on it. I'll start with Christine. Um, and that is about the digital divide. And so, you know, you've all mentioned the use of technology, some virtual components, um, but we know that there are lots of folks who are not necessarily technologically literate. Um, so how do you, address that challenge during this very um, difficult time? How do you do training and introduce new virtual kinds of events to folks who may not have been online beforehand? Well, that is difficult. Um, it really depends if they have a device that they can use. I mean, I see a lot of seniors who do have smartphones and you can do it on your phone. It's just a matter of taking the steps to be able to do that. And sometimes that takes time and patience. Um, that's why we have used many of our interns and many of our volunteers um, to be able to sit with them, uh, not sit with them, virtually sit with them um, and walk them through it. You know, just saying, this is what I'm looking at. How can I do this? Whether it's emailing them instructions, step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. Um, even if we tried to make it as simple as possible, we're on the website. So there wasn't much they had to do besides go to our virtual programming button and whatever program they wanted to do, all they had to do was click on it. And it got them to our Facebook page. Um, the, the one thing that was a challenge for them is a lot of them said, I, I'm not on Facebook and I don't want to, and my kids don't want me on Facebook. <laughs> That's a lot of them like, don't know, you're not going on. So what they needed to, what we tried to teach them is that you don't need to belong to Facebook. You don't have to have an account. If you go to our website, you go on as just a visitor to our site. So there's nothing personal they have to put on there. Um, it makes people feel a little better about it um, and, and being able to be involved with it. Plus, you can't underestimate the fact that these people are helping each other. You know, there's a, a group of women that we have that, well, somebody will call up and say, oh, you had a problem getting on. 
listen, this is what I learned. And they walk each other through it. It's really impressive how they have, and I think people underestimate this in seniors, um, that they still have a strong desire and drive to be a part of things and enjoy things and, and, and learn things every day on an everyday basis. So, we, you know, our, our, our phone calls are very high in volume and we spend the time in trying to walk them through as much as we can. Yeah, if you don't mind, you jump in for a second. Yeah, yeah it, it really is it's an interesting mix. Uh, some seniors are extremely savvy um, with the technology. I mean, to the point where, you know, they scare me um, how good they are. And then others are just, uh, there seems to be no middle ground, either extremely high tech or basically pen and pencil. Yep. Okay. Um, another related question uh, for both of you, George and Christine, is about the robotic pets. Where mm -hmm. are they purchased? Can you talk a little bit more about them? And then how do people learn how to use them? Um, Christine, I'll go real fast if you don't mind. The, the simple part is uh, call our office. Uh, call the Nassau County Office for the Aging, New York Connects, 516-227-8900. 516-227-8900. We'll be more than happy to give you all the details as to uh, what's available, uh, the dogs, the cats, uh, where to buy them. And, and depending, and I hate to say this, but um, you may qualify for a free one, depending uh, if you fall within a certain, certain boundary. So please call our office. And if you don't qualify, we'll definitely help you get one and hopefully give you a discount code so you can get it at a decent price. Excellent. And at the end, I do have um, a slide about additional resources and I have that phone number on the slide. Yeah. So you will um, just get that in, in a minute. Thank you. Um, okay, great. So um, here's a question in the chat that I'm gonna uh, post. Stu, I think it's really for you. And, and you started, I think, to answer it in the chat, but maybe you could engage everybody else about it. Somebody said, you know, why, why was it that um, the SHIP and the Javits Center weren't used to um, care for patients that were being discharged from the hospital with COVID? Why were they coming into rehab facilities like your own? Um, and if you could just kind of, you know, bring that um, to light for the rest of our, our viewers. When I first learned that the SHIP and the Javits Center would be used for COVID positive patients, I thought that was the answer uh, to all of us because the last thing we wanted to do was to introduce positive patients. The situation was tough as it is to add positive patients to our population here that, as I described before, as vulnerable. Unfortunately, the SHIP and the Javits Center were so underutilized, they were only used for a very short period of time. I don't know the reasoning behind that. Um, I will suspect that staffing was probably a great challenge. Uh, but that would have been the answer to us instead of introducing them to all of us. And I actually had predicted that there would be a building, a facility in each county that might have been utilized and rehabbed to be that care center for COVID-19 patients. There are vacant buildings that were nursing homes in every county, certainly the counties in the downstate region. And if that was able to be figured out in terms of staffing, supply, and rehabbing those buildings, I think in the end, the cost probably would be less to the whole system by staffing those buildings. And that would have calmed families down, which then would not have created that regulatory and, uh, and stir in the media. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, again, that I think uh, really goes out to any of the three of you. What are your agencies doing to educate seniors and their caregivers, families about COVID? There's so much misinformation spreading, particularly on social media, that it seems it would be beneficial for your members. So if you could talk specifically about that. I'll jump in again just real quick. I mentioned our website before. We created a COVID-19 tab on our webpage. Everything is there mandates, uh, updates for families, data, everything imaginable so that the record is set straight because yes, on social media, sometimes things run astray and there's a lot of misinformation, but there we put everything out there. So I can't tell you how many times a day we would be redirecting families or even other individuals, interested parties saying, go to the website, it's all there. Thank you, Christine or George, you wanna say anything about that? We also have it on our website. 
things on our Facebook page. And like I said before, we had Dr. Kieber on um, Facebook Live. We're going to continue to do that as much as we can to connect with the hospital. They've been very, very cooperative with us um, in giving us the most updated information and, and what we can share. Um, so we're going to continue doing that as long as possible so that people can stay safe, but also know when it's important that they need to go and take care of their medical situation. I think George is going to say something. Yes, you know, we've been very lucky with our partners. They've done a great job of keep uh, getting the word out. And also, as, as Stuart said, as you know, we put as soon as anything comes out, we put it on our website and our Facebook as quickly as possible and just keep sharing the information. So uh, it's, it's, it's a constant, constant dialogue. Excellent. I guess um, the last question that I'll ask, and you've all three addressed it, but maybe you want to say one other comment about it. And that is, you know, we know that the risk of social isolation is severe and it was a risk and a concern for older adults and vulnerable populations before the pandemic. And now as you're going through it, you're doing really innovative things in terms of online and virtual programming. What other kinds of advice can you give to family caregivers, to older adults living in the community, to um, folks who are working with this population to try and continue to promote the importance of physical distancing, but keeping people socially connected? I think you're on mute. Christine, did you want to say? Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, the, the, as you said, the social isolation is extremely difficult. And, and we did have, um, you know, we've had seniors that we have seen through the time walking around and, and not being as careful as they can be, but we're trying to do as much as we can. We're giving out masks for everybody. You know, we do know that, you know, sometimes individuals, they just need to get fresh air. They need to be outside of their house, especially if they're in an apartment. They, they need to have, you know, feel that air, be able to feel like they are, are still living. So, I mean, we're trying to do as much as we can. We're, we're giving out masks um, that we've had donated. We've had so many individuals who have made homemade masks. We've got masks donated by um, Tom Swazi's office in the library. So we're trying to you know, let them know and remind them how important it is that, you know, they love to go up and hug somebody when they see them, but you can't do it. Um, that it's more, you know, I keep saying, just go like this when you see somebody, put your hand on your heart, you know, that's as much of a hug. Um, that if you do have to be out, and there are some seniors that do have to go out, just be cognizant of that um, as much as you possibly can. And that, you know, just reminding them as, as diligent as we can be right now will get us out and back to normal sooner rather than later. I think I'll just add that also a lesson learned is that you can never do enough for families. You can never post enough information. It's almost the expression, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. We did so many things and no matter what you do. I mean, I consider us, you know, one of the most transparent organizations you'll find. And we'd have people say, you're not being transparent enough. And I would laugh. So the really, it's an important lesson. You think you've got everything there, post more. Um, you think you're communicating well, you still may not be communicating enough. It really makes a difference. Yeah, if, if I can just echo to that, it's the same thing. As, and a lot of it's just uh, constant reinforcement communications. That's why for us it was so important that the centers call their, their members on a daily basis. Uh, and nothing else is going to do, but also to keep their communications going. And we also found that by providing these shelf-stable boxes, uh, it gave people what they needed, but at the same time minimized the number of times they would have to leave their house. Uh, we're also uh, beginning to have a conversation when we do reopen up again, um, you know, since, and, and the weather cooperates to begin to have the centers to some of their activities outside. Uh, some of them do have the capacity, uh, whether it be in the backyard or a park nearby, instead of doing in, internally, have, have the group, you know, the group meeting outside. Maybe do what we're also looking at, maybe changing our lunch program where we do more of a grab and go where instead of having sit down dinner, we'll do a, a bag lunch. So the seniors, they can be, be taken with them to the park or to the beach or somewhere they can, they're outside at the same time, keep that, that safe distance. Excellent. I can add, uh, yep. Elise, you know, asked a question in the chat box I see about, you know, psychiatric care and what we're doing for folks. And yes, we're doing all of those, all of those, providing all those services to our residents, but to staff as well. So we have made our, psychosocial uh, staff, both psycho psychologists and social workers available with schedules 
for our staff because they have been through the worst of this. Imagine, you know, they come to work every day. Uh, they've had to worry about getting sick and are they going to bring it home to their loved ones? Or are they sick and are they bringing it in? And so um, they've really been going through a very different experience than some of us who, of course, were, you know, handling the pandemic, but they're more on the front lines than others of us are. Excellent. Thank you, Stu, for responding to that. Um, and thank you to all our speakers. I, I have a couple of, of quick slides and, and we'll see if another uh, question or two comes in, but um, I just want to, you know, share what many of you already know, um, that as we open up, we have to really stay diligent in terms of protecting ourselves and our loved ones and our communities, and that it's not just those who are working with or visiting older adults, really supporting older adults is everyone's business. And if we're all safe, those of us who across the entire uh, age spectrum, we support older adults in that way. So we need to continue to practice physical distancing and avoiding close contact with people who are sick and wearing that mask and avoiding crowds, washing hands often, avoiding touching eyes, nose and mouth, cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces and monitoring our health. I'm glad that you all mentioned that, not just for symptoms of possible COVID, but for other kinds of health issues that we need to make sure that we are remembering and that we're in touch with our, our, our healthcare providers. Um, I also wanted to leave everyone with just, uh, and obviously it's not exhaustive, but a list of helpful COVID-19 resources for older adults, caregivers, and providers. First off, um, you know, Nassau County does have um, a, a mobile device um, initiative where you can text COVID-19 NC for Nassau County to 888-777 to get updates, and I, um, I'm a uh, a member of that now, so I do get um, updates directly to my mobile phone, which is great. You heard from George earlier about the Nassau County Coronavirus Hotline, 227-8900, it's on your screen, and we're going to send these slides to every attendee after, so you'll have um, them, you don't have to uh, jot them down right now. But um, the CDC and the New York State Department of Health, the AARP and the National Council on Aging, Hartford and the ASA, the American Society on Aging, um, these are the kinds of, of websites that I'll be on on a regular basis. They have updated information, they have statistics, they have short videos, they have um, uh, testimonials, other kinds of articles that could be really very helpful. And so I would, you know, hope you would um, would you know visit some of those. Um, I'm gonna look once more just for one more question in the chat before we conclude. Um, and some people are asking for copies of the slide, which is great. Um, they're, and they're making reference to kind of other resources that are available. Um, like linkage projects and, and NORCs, which is excellent. Um, I just wanna thank our speakers once again. We've learned so much from you, and I think I speak for everyone when we say we're so grateful for the good work that you're doing and that your staff have been doing to protect older adults on Long Island. Um, I also want to just remind everybody that if anybody needs a certificate of attendance that they can email me. I have on this slide my email address and my phone number. Um, also, you know, in addition to holding free webinars throughout the year, Hofstra also has many academic programs that train students in the best practices associated with supporting vulnerable populations in advocacy and administration and public health. We have a new advanced certificate in healthy aging, uh, a master of public health, an advanced certificate in public health, and among many others. And so you can email me if you'd like more information about those or visit our websites. I did put up um, both websites today. And um, again, thank you all for attending. Thanks to our speakers. Um, please stay healthy. And this concludes our presentation. Good afternoon, everyone.